there are a number of oscillators that we've got for measuring uh, momentum on the site, um, and they're broken into a couple of different flavors. So we're going to kind of discuss what an oscillator is. We're going to kind of go over the two two camps they fall into, how you can tell by looking at the uh, the chart of the oscillator which one it is, and what each one attempts, what each camp attempts to do. Um, they do different things, and they can be used differently. So we're going to try and go th through uh, all of that. Let's see here. We're going to see. We're going to go through what they are. We're going to talk about the two different camps that they fall into. We're going to see how each camp differs and what they attempt to uh, to go over. And of course, we're going to go through a whole bunch of examples. So let me just pop over here quickly to a chart. Um, so the, the oscillator, of course, is just something that goes up and down with some frequency. And we can break those into two camps. One is what we would call a banded oscillator, which means it goes and tends to hit specific areas. And the attempt there is to measure extremes. And within the banded camp, we have bounded, which means that the oscillator goes between two specific ranges in case, say, 0 to 100, uh, minus 100 to 100, um, uh, some specific range of items, and it's bounded, and it won't go outside that range. Our second class is center line. And those will oscillate around a center line. And those, instead of showing extremes, are meant to sort of indicate changes in momentum. So we use those to sort of see when things are beginning to shift, uh, whereas our banded ones, we, we see when we've gone to very far ends of the, the momentum range where it's extremely overbought, oversold. We're getting, um, like we want to see very far moving uh, examples of momentum. So we've got those two general classes and what I've got here is a chart and this just is a Boeing chart and I've put up and you can see we've got a lot of them. I'm, obviously we can't go into a lot of detail and so I'm going to kind of stay high level and we're going to go over the different camps. We're going to see examples in each camp and we're going to see how each one of them acts differently and how we would use them. So the first camp up here we've got what our, we would call our banded and these of course you can see all have a, a range. Um, some of them, like the RSI and the stochastics, happen to be bounded as well. They have a zero to 100 scale. So RSI is probably the most popular in terms of the banded. Um, I would say stochastics is probably a close second. Uh, RSI relative strength is basically an attempt to gauge one's own momentum. It's kind of a misnomer because relative strength makes it sound, we talk a lot, Tom, about strength relative to the S&P or to the its indus, uh, stocks industry or sector. In the case here, RSI relative strength is against itself. It's its, its own relative strength. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, David Keller just did an excellent blog on RSI and how he uses it. Um, I invite you to go check that out. That was uh, sometime last week or maybe late the week before. And we've got a range basically here. And what we do is we look to see when we hit certain extremes of the range. So we've got our line here at 30 and 70. And those are sort of the accepted values of when we have start to hit extreme ranges of our own relative performance. So that means when we've, we're really gaining a lot of momentum, our price is changing quite rapidly relative to what it's been changing in our, in our window here. RSI, we've got a 14 period window. So that's when we can start to really see a lot of big price movements within our 14 day history. And we can see when we get over here, Boeing has had a nice bump on earnings and it's making a lot of big moves. And that's when we start to see our, our RSI move up above this range of 70, which is some places like I know, Tom, you would sort of look to be a little bit wary when we start to change that much. You may want to see a little bit of a pullback. Other people say that this is the sign that momentum is, is gaining and simply because we hit one of these extremes doesn't mean that we're going to immediately bounce out of it. We can have uh, momentum that it lasts for some time. You can get into this 70 range and be there quite comfortably for quite a period of time. So it's not sort of a, as soon as we hit this, we are going to instantly sell because the probability is we're going to bounce off of this and come back. Uh, so we can, we can stay in this range for quite some time. We do bounce off of these. And a lot of times here we sort of stay in the middle and we're just kind of moving around um, with not a lot of momentum. Um, our next one is stochastics. Stochastics attempts to measure within our time period here, say 14, where are we within the, the range that we've established in that? So the highest high and the lowest low 
if we were to plot our current point, where are we within that range? And we keep that as a percentage. So we have a zero to 100. That's a bounded band. Uh, we can see here that there we look at an 80, 20. So if we've got a, if we're in the bottom 20% of our 14 day bay or 14 month, 14 week period, we don't have a lot of momentum to the upside. We sort of, we're in the bottom of our doldrums there for our window and not a lot is happening. If we're up in the upper percentages, the upper 80, 90%, we can see that clearly we're in the top of our range and we've got some upside momentum. Um, we as well, obviously we'll pass through 50, uh, but in general on the stochastics, we don't hang around the middle range. We'll, we'll tend to, to move up to the top and bottom ranges. With a lot of these, all of these bandits, if you, they're better for, I say, they're, they're for predicting extremes. So when you get to the middle range, the momentum has sort of left the building and they're not quite as effective. Uh, I was essentially saying in the case of a stochastic, if we hang around the 50 range, it means we're in the middle of our 14 day window in price. So we're not the high, we're not the low. If we stay in that range for quite some time, we've essentially lost momentum. Um, and then in that case, it's probably better to use a slightly different indicator to track uh, what's going on. Hey, Bill. Yes. Yeah, you know, when I, I mean RSI and stochastic are the two that I generally have on my chart. I always have RSI. Sometimes I have st stochastic, and I get the question sometimes: Why do I have stochastic on my charts? Because I never talk about it. And for me, when you look at this chart, I mean this is a good example. The problem I have with stochastic is it moves much faster than some of the like RSI. So, for instance, if we go back on your chart that you're showing there to about, say, September 14th or so, Stochastics moves into overbought territory above 80. But that's just the start of the move. If you go up to the price action, the, the stock or, or the uh, yeah, the stock is just making a breakout above those prior highs. And if you look at the RSI at that same time, the RSI is barely in the 50s. And so I like to see when they both, the reason I have both of them on my charts is I think one confirms the other in terms of overbought. So if you look at that final move at the beginning of October, um, yeah, right up there at that high, the, the stochastics has stayed overbought for two or three weeks at that point, but the RSI finally gets up and goes overbought at the same time. And that is when you start to see more weakness. So for me, and it's just my interpretation, I mean, everybody's welcome to have their own interpretation, but I, a lot of times will use RSI as another momentum oscillator tool to confirm what the stochastics has shown me. And again, I think stochastics, the same thing, by the way, happened at the beginning of January. You can see stochastics in the first few days go above 80. And then look at, if you got out when that hit overbought, uh, you'd have missed the last six weeks of the move to the upside. Now, granted, uh, RSI is way overbought now as well. But the point for me is that I, I like to see both of them overbought, overbought or oversold before I start to consider the message that's sent. I don't know how you use them, whether you use them similarly or whether you're not at all. But uh, anyhow, I just thought I'd point that out. Right. And the stochastic, like I say, it, it represents where you are from the previous range. So in, in that sense, it sort of breaks it into boxes. You know, you've, you've like say, we've, we've in this area of September, we've we're looking here when we've broken out of this range here of this range at maybe this box here is essentially what this is character. So we are at the top of this box, but as the price moves up, we're continuing to stay in the box as we move along. So that's why this will stay up above here and it will take a little bit more time for something like an RSI to start to capture that. Yep. Yeah. And I think too, the, you know, just a follow up to what you're saying there, you know, stochastics, you, you can have a, a 14 day period. I guess it's, it's actually three days average, I guess. So it has to stay there for three days, but you can have a two or two and a half week period where a stock doesn't do much at all. But if it just happens to close three straight days near the top of the range, it'll look on stochastics like it's very overbought. And I would just maybe point back to the middle of April. Right. Um, Stochastics goes up to like 90 or into the 90s. And yet when you look at the price action on the chart, it really hasn't done that much. But it just happens to be closing near the high of a, the previous 14-day range. Right. It's a little bit faster. Yes. It's, it's period and timing. So it's, of course, like a lot of these, uh, you need to use multiple um, indicators to try and get a broader picture. And uh, But that, excellent point. Um we're going to bounce down now to the CCI, the Commodity Channel Index. This is another one that's uh, banded, but it's not bound. There is some 
uh, mathematics inside the CCI that tries to put most of the signal within this minus 100 to 100 range, but clearly uh, it can move out of that range. And it's, it's a indicator that tries to catch the distance from a, 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 like a moving average, so how far the price has moved away from, its, from an average. So we can see here as well, it will get into this above 100, below 100. It will typically stay, spend most of its time within that range, but it can bounce out again when we get the extreme moves these extreme big momentum moves up or down, we'll see the, the CCI exceed this 100 minus 100 range. And the Arun I threw on, this is probably not as popular. Um, this isn't really um, as much of a price momentum. It's, it tries to gauge trend more, but it's just another momentum um, uh, uh, oscillator here that is basically the difference. If you've seen the Arun, there's a red line and a and a green line, and this is simply the distance between those two lines, and it's bounded between minus 100 and 100. So it as well is a uh, bounded band oscillator example. And now we're going to get down to the second camp, which there are more of, and those would be the um, center lines. And this I know, Tom, this is one of your go-tos, and um, Aaron also has her PMO, and they're all examples of center lines and when they cross is basically we're trying to figure out if there's been a, a fundamental change we're sort of this is more of a, a little bit more of a leading attempt to be a leading indicator and often these are used in um, concert with um, prices and looking for divergences so we're, we're looking to see if these uh, momentum indicators are giving us sort of a leading example of what is to come and is starting to change relative to price uh, price action um, I know you had talked to Tom that you used to use the MACD and I use the PMO or the PPO. And those are, of course, if you can see the, the graph here, are the exact same thing, except that the, uh, the PPO uses it as a percentage. So those tend to level, make it more equal between stocks since they're all on a percentage basis as opposed to an absolute basis. But you can see chart is exactly the same. And what we'll have here, I know you've talked about center line crossings and say, this period here where the, the moving averages all sort of sit on top of each other is when we start to lose momentum. Um, and we can see it here with the RSI if we go back. This means within its own range, it's it's meandering over this 50% line here. And it's just kind of by definition lost momentum. And we can see that on other indicators as well. So it, it proves that our indicators are capturing sort of what, we, what we're seeing in the chart. Um, I threw both the PPO and the uh, MACD on here just to go over that example that you had talked about when we were before the show of switching from one to the other and that the, the PPO is a little bit more, um, you can go apples to apples against other stocks to sort of see how things are uh, performing against each other. Um, we got the histograms here showing when we get to our center line pause. So you talk about center line re, uh, crossings and resetting a momentum. And this is one of those examples where we come up and down. PMO, obviously very similar uh, structure. So we can tell just by looking at the two that it probably also uses um, a similar uh, sets of uh, moving averages and whatnot to get very similar results. Again, we have this sort of dead zone here where we've lost momentum and we come up with a similar sort of uh, behavior pattern where we've got the breakout. Uh, one of the questions I know we had um, on the show is talking about multicollinearity, and I'm not a statistical expert, um, so I won't really dive into a lot of it, but the, the basic idea is that a lot of these indicators use the same underlying processes or the same underlying um, data, obviously, to come up with a number at the indicator. So what you wanna to try to avoid is using the same indicator that all the indicators use the same underlying information. So you're basically getting a scenario where you're, you're talking to the choir. All of your indicators are telling you the same thing because all of the indicators are essentially using the same methodology to come up with an answer. So that's when you want to try and avoid, say, having all three of these, the PMO, the PPO, and the PMO, and the MACD as your sole set of indicators because it's basically telling you the same thing because they're all derived using a common set of of indicators. So you want to kind of mix them up like we were talking the oscillators of like the stochastic and the RSI. You want to kind of have a, a broad set that use different methodologies to to uh, give you an idea. So you don't want to just get the same indicators that use the same uh, process 
and then base your decisions on that. And to, to, um, Tom, did, this, uh, did you have any comments on your uh, MACD PPO switch? Um, yeah, but before I get into that, there was one question in the room. I, I'll pass this along to you first. And that is, you know, many of these indicators were created a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the authors, you know, use certain parameters for 14 day for RSI, 12.26.9 for MACD and so forth. Um, do you think it's beneficial to stick with those original um, parameters? Or do you think that there's some evidence maybe to use different parameters? Um, I suppose, you know, the, the market, you know, fear and greed hasn't changed a lot. Um, I don't know the rationale with some of these time periods. I would suppose if within certain markets, you might say, well, maybe we're moving into a market that's much more volatile. So maybe we want to change these to be a slightly shorter, um, capture a shorter time period. Uh, if you're really looking to be a little bit more nimble, of course, you're going to get more whipsaws. Um, I, would imagine that a lot of the the original theory is still holds um i suppose one thing you could look at is how does you know high frequency trading that's something that probably didn't exist as much clearly in the 1970s maybe when some of these are 80s 90s when some of these were put together i don't know necessarily how i would tweak some of these to to factor that in well how, how what would you say on that how would you think that's a lot of changes occurred there well i almost always go with the default and the reason I go with the default is it just makes sense to me because if I'm trying to predict what other traders or what other mar what other market participants are going to do exactly. looking at the market, if they're all using a default and I'm using something that nobody else is looking at, it's I don't know how I can predict what's going to happen off of that those parameters. You know what I mean? Right. We all use the 200 day and the 50 day because everybody else does. And now the black boxes are programmed to use those dates. So that sort of becomes the de facto standard. Right. Right. And so for me, I like to use the default because I think it helps me to predict what other traders are going to do because most other traders use the default. Um, I can't justify just coming up with it. I mean, I could always, you know, you can pigeonhole things and I could go back and look at a chart and say, well, it's not really bouncing off the 20 day moving average or the 50 day moving average. But if I insert the 31 day moving average, you know, everything's perfect. Well, right. you know, you can always make something fit on that particular chart. But the question is, you know, does it make any sense? Does it make sense that something would bounce off a 31 day moving average for me? No, because nobody else would be buying off a 31 day moving average. So right. that would be my thoughts there. And as far as the MACD and the PPO go, I used the MACD for a long time. I finally made the switch. It was probably three years ago, something like that. I mean, I had been using the MACD for many years. And there's really no difference. The difference you pointed out, Bill, is that the, the PPO, you're taking those two, you're taking a 12 period and a 26 period moving average, and you're taking the difference in terms of percent for the PPO. For the MACD, you're just strictly taking it in terms of dollars. So if you wanted to compare, for instance, the momentum in Sirius XM Holdings, which is you know $5 stock, $6, whatever it is, and compare it to Amazon, which is you know $1,600, $1,700 stock, if you use the MACD, well, of course, Amazon is going to have, in terms of dollars, much wider differences between its two moving averages than, say, Sirius XM is going to have. But if you base it on the PPO, which is a percentage difference of the two moving averages, then you should be able to compare momentum on Sirius versus momentum on Amazon. Right. The, the PPO to me just makes more sense. It was just getting out of the habit. I'm very much a routine type of person. And so the MACD was just it for me. I knew the PPO was always better. I just never wanted to make the switch. And I just finally one day got up and made the switch. Right. And, and that's my what I would say is the main difference is since the PPO is much better for comparing momentum, you know, and doing more apples than apples and make the playing field a little more level so you can do a comparison. If you're, if you're looking between two stocks, do I like this one or that one? PPO is probably a little bit more uh, useful in helping that comparison. Yeah. And the other thing that I found too, with the PPO, because it does give you a percentage difference, um, I, and again, this is just a personal thing with me and how I use the, the PPO and the way I used to use the MACD. Um, if you get a stock that is 
I'm not going to say parabolic move, but if you get a stock that's really moving rapidly in one direction or the other, you will see the PPO get either above 10% or below 10%. And you're almost always going to see a negative divergence, you know, on an uptrend, negative divergence, or in a downtrend, a positive divergence emerge because it's very difficult to keep that slope of a price going uh, to keep a PPO at 10%. I mean, it's just, it's almost impossible. I mean, there are a few exceptions out there, but for the most part, you're going to see a negative divergence emerge in that kind of a situation. And when I used to do the MACD, I'd have to take the, the MACD and divide it by the price of the stock to get a sense of, have we, have we reached that 10% level? Well, when I use the PPO, I don't have to do any calculations. It tells me when I'm at the 10% level. So there are some other reasons that I think it, for me anyway, it works better now that I've gotten used to the PPO. Right, right. Great. All right. Well, we'll keep uh, keep going along here. The next one I threw in was slightly different is the, uh, speaking of our friend Julius and RRG is the uh, RRG oscillator. And this is relative strength and it does uh, go against a different stock unlike the RSI. And uh, in this case, we're looking at Boeing versus the, um, the S&P 500 index. And as you would expect, um, over time, those will have different uh, values of who's outperforming whom. And so we can uh, capture that with Julius's uh, momentum oscillator here. That's just another example. And then you were just talking about um, percentages and rates of change. So ROC, the rate of change, is probably the mo one of the most basics in terms of rating ourself. This is just a percentage change over a window. Um, again, it, it oscillates between up and ab above and below zero as to whether it's going up or down. Uh, again, we have this case here. We had our sort of our no man's land. You can see here our our rate of change is essentially flat for some period of time, showing that we've we're not making a big move in any direction. But then we can get over here and we can see this is when our bigger bigger moves in momentum. So if we have an ROC that's basically around this center line, again, sort of a, a signal that we've kind of lost momentum and momentum's just we're kind of drifting sideways. That's another common theme with these center. And uh, the center um, oscillating indicators. Then we got a couple more that are a little bit um, prettier. <laughs> they show us here where we've gone up above in our, our center line, the taking money flow and the, the DPO. Again, um, in at the purest form, above the line is showing momentum, positive momentum, and below is negative momentum. We can see, of course, here we've got changing momentum as we got a downtrend here in the money flow. Um, also used with uh, divergences, very common scenario for both of those. Um, and then we're going to start to move into a slightly different class, and I'll just kind of finish out this group of indicators of indicators. So this is the ultimate oscillator, which if it were really, we would just have talked about this and been done. Um, the ultimate oscillator uses um, buying pressure and I believe some true range and then it takes maybe three or four different time period moving averages, puts that into a formula and comes up with a number. Um, so it's sort of much more of an indicator of indicators um, with some hybrid formula behind it, getting a little bit more complex and using the multiple um, moving averages attempts to sort of smooth out and give different weights to the long-term, medium-term, short-term um, performances. Again, it looks very similar to the RSI. So in this case, we've got a banded uh, oscillator that's bound, 0 to 100. And we have the same areas of extremes. So we've got 70 and 30. So very similar. We tend to spend much more of our time inside this range than we do in the extremes. So that's a little bit different than the RSI. Another indicator that's uh, fairly common that is an indicator of indicators is Martin Pring's um, no sure thing, the KST, and it takes several um, uh, moving averages. I think I should see that this one and or the special K that take, I think, eight or nine indicator uh, time periods to really get a, a broad selection of time periods and then merge all of that into a single indicator. And even that shows still we have got our, our loss of momentum in this this area that we've seen in other other indicators. So it, it behaves. All these oscillators, like say, fall into two camps and they behave differently. They try and track things slightly differently. And these examples here that we're using multi uh, indicators of indicators pieced together in different ways to come up with a, a single one. But 
a lot of times they still still follow the general behavior. The next one is not really an, an oscillator as, we, as such that we typically think about it, as, but the scooter does have a, a zero to 100 range in that sense it is band and uh, bound. Uh, it also uses multiple time frames. It uses six independent pieces of data, two in the long term, two in the medium term, two in the short term to come up with a number. And these are based on relative strengths within what we call the universe. And this will be, say, Boeing is going to be in the large caps, and we may have several hundred, or in some cases, in the case of the small caps, like the Russell 2000 or the ETFs or, say, the, uh, the TSX, we're going to have hundreds and thousands of stocks that this is uh, being put against in terms of relative performance. Uh, we don't have a, a set limit here, banding, like we would say with the ultimate or the RSI of a, a 30, 70, or maybe the stochastics of an 80, 20. But if you talk to probably our biggest proponent of the scooters, Greg Schnell, he often talks about a 70, 30 sort of split. We haven't really specifically marked that, uh, but a lot of times he looks for things that are outperforming 70% of its brethren or underperforming 30. So it's, again, sort of similar. It's a little bit outside, uh, but I thought I'd just throw that in there because this behavior is fairly similar. And our last one that I've got here. Oh, go ahead, Tom. I was just going to add one thing, too, on that scooter. And I think the reason, you know, 70 or 75 makes a lot of sense to me, at least to, you know, to, to get above that level, is that, for those of you, and you can go into the chart school and pull up the article on scooter to, to get into the calculations, but 60% of that scooter score is based on long-term indicators. So it's weighted very heavily toward long-term performance. So you're not going to get a stock that comes out with good news one day, gets a spike, and all of a sudden shoots up into the 90s on the uh, scooter. Um, not if it didn't already have a pretty good number to begin with. Um, but 60% of it is based on long-term indicators, which is looking at the percentage, of, I think it's above below the 200-day EMA. Mm -hmm. And then the other, that's 30%. And the other 30% of the long-term indicator is the 125-day rate of change. Right. And you talked about that rate of change. So right. you've got to have a pretty good look on your chart relative to all, in the case of Boeing, and you know, relative to all the other large-cap stocks out there, you've got to have... Uh, you know, there's got to be a lot of uh, movement well above your 200-day EMA and then also that 125-day rate of change in order to get yourself up into that 75 care, um, uh, category. So I think there's something to be said for, you know, trying to stick with stocks that have scooters above 70, 75, because you know that they have to have a certain element of long-term strength to get there. And if you're looking for outperformance, I mean, you, by definition, you've you've gotten outperformance within that group. Um, you will sometimes see a scooter pop. I know we've gotten question support uh, into, into the customer support team sometimes of you'll see a scooter do a huge pop in one direction, but today's change isn't that much. And they'll say, well, what's the, what's the difference? And sometimes you have to go back to that 200 days or that 125 days, and you see that there was a huge event that happened, you know, a major gap happened 200 days ago, and suddenly the 200-day average piece has taken that into account and it's completely dropped off or it's completely has shown that that big move has finally disappeared 200 days ago that will affect the scooter change now so sometimes we will get these adjustments uh, months later when we've had a, a massive change in the price um, in the past so you, you can see what appear to be bizarre reactions on the scooters sometimes but if you look back at the the, uh, those time windows going through the chart, you can see sometimes you'll get those. Good, very good point. All right, and our last one is the uh, uh, Tushar Chande's uh, trend meter. This is a relatively new addition, maybe in the last couple of years. Um, it's another example of a bounded, banded. It's a zero to 100. It's very similar in intent to the scooter. It also uses multiple data points to generate its number. I believe from when I was writing this up, it was, it uses standard deviations. It uses um, Bollinger Bands, position within the Bollinger Bands, and then it takes a number of moving averages, cranks all of that out and comes up with a number. Like the RSI and unlike the scooter or the, um, the RRG, the CTM is ag against itself. It's its own momentum indicator. Um, so it's, it's not comparing it relative to anything else. And you can see just by the, uh, the coloring scheme that there are 
set bands here. We've got about five of them. We got a zero to look like 25. Then we've got the middle band. We've got three upper bands. And again, I would invite if you want to go to into any of these a little bit more detail, uh, look at chart school. But obviously, you're you're talking about the red band is it's relatively in its worst session of um, windows of momentum. And obviously, when you get up into those green bands, you're talking about some uh, momentum is, is turned around quite a bit. So um, you can make decisions here um, on when it ends, enters certain bands. I know even within the scooters, there's a lot of people who would think, well, maybe 30 versus 20. So um, Tushar has developed us with three or four different interesting bands that you can take advantage of there and, and kind of play around with. With any of these, um, we can change the parameters. Like you talked about the question of, you know, are the parameters exist or the defaults exist? If you want faster action or slower action, you can, of course, change this um, with any indicator. You know, faster action means more whipsaws. Slower means maybe you miss the move. And it's so, sort of a, a bit of art and science there. Going back to your point, Tom, about, you know, picking a 31-day average is one of the things I see people do with back testing. You know, they'll... They'll keep tweaking a model to make it match the past history perfectly. And then it goes for a few weeks or a month or two into the into the future and the model doesn't work and they throw it away. So that's one of the reasons I've sort of not been a huge um, proponent of back testing because I think people tweak the models to get it to match what happened. And then the first time it goes horribly wrong, they throw it out. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a system and, you know, consistently applying it. Oh, yes. But to try to pigeonhole or try to make something, you know, try to come up with something that makes it work in that current environment over a one year period, I think can be a mistake when you try to take it forward. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Doing predictable stuff uh, consistent is is definitely the way to go. It's when I see people try and say, well, I, if I like you said, well, if I change it to 31.8436, it works all of a sudden magically. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not buying that. <laughs> We're not going to go with that. There were a couple more questions in the room before uh, we wrap this uh, segment up, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, one was, um, do you have any thoughts about the Williams uh, percent R? And because um, that's obviously a momentum oscillator. We didn't go over that one, but. Right. Um, I haven't used that one as much. Um, I can throw that on here. We can take a quick look. Yeah, I don't use it either, but isn't that like the reverse of the stochastics or something? It's not one that I've ever worked with. That, again, looks like it's uh, this is bounded here. Um, yeah, I haven't really spent a lot of time working with the Williams. Um, I know a lot of people have used that. Um, it does look like it's got a, a stochastic type behavior. Yeah, and it's in minuses. I think I think if you pull if you put it up there next to the stochastic, it might be somewhat similar. Right. So, um, and it used that 14 day look back period as well. Just going to pop a stochastic next to it because it's a little bit faster than that. Uh... Yeah, let's see if they are similar. It's, yeah, very similar. Um, another, another thing is just sort of a wrap up of this um, whole thing is that now I'm hoping that you'll be able, if somebody, goes to the the proverbial cocktail party and shows you an unknown oscillator you should be able to get some idea of just based on its its behavior its visuals is this banded is it bound is it a center line if it's a banded it's trying to show us extremes if it's a center line it's trying to show us changes and maybe used in, in um, like say in concert with uh, divergences um, so just seeing a um, the chart of an oscillator now you should be able to look at it and get a, a pretty quick idea of what it's trying to do and what it's trying to accomplish just based on its composition mm -hmm. all right one one final question and this is a good one um i've got my thoughts but i want to hear yours first these indicators work best in volatile markets right question mark uh, a narrowly traded or trending stock will not work well using them is this correct what do you think well, certainly, like we've seen cases up here, uh, our KST is flat, our uh, rate of change is flat, um, RSI is flat, um, and a sideways trending. I mean, if you've got an upward trending or downward trending, then you know you you may get some better some better uh, signs out of these. But I would certainly say if you've got a sideways, I was trying to find a good example of uh, 
something that had a, a flat trend here. I'll see if I can find here. I think Lulumon, uh, let's see, had demonstrated a period where we had some, some of our uh, momentum oscillators kind of going sideways. This period here, you know, we've got almost an entire quarter where we've basically got a trading range, but also look how small our boxes are. You know, our, our candles are very small. So we're going to see a lot of these um, oscillators sit around the rate of change almost goes completely flat. Um, ultimate oscillators almost again completely flat. Scooter is flat, but that's a relative thing. So it's a little bit harder to, to, to place that. So if you get something that's trends sideways for a long time, right around these 50 marks, I would say that those are a little bit, these indicators, you know, just show there's not a lot of momentum at that point. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? Well, I, you know, when I look at, uh, and I use again, mostly RSI, occasionally stochastics, but mostly I'm, I'm an RSI guy. And so, you know, RSI in theory, 30 is oversold. And when you get to 70, you're overbought. And I think in a trendless market, when you're just going sideways for a while, I think that relationship holds true. I think when you get into an uptrending market, I don't necessarily look at RSI. I don't look for pullbacks to take the RSI back to 30. A lot of times in a uptrending stock or index, you'll see the RSI pull back into the 40s. And I, I tend to use 40 as my oversold level when I've got an uptrending stock. And so I, you know, if I get to a key moving average or I get to a key price support on a pullback and I look down and I see the RSI is at 42, a lot of times that's further confirmation to me that that's a good solid reward to risk time to get into a, an uptrending stock. Um, and likewise, you know, when you're in a sideways consolidation, many times you'll see the RSI between 30 and 70 and, you know, you might not even get to either one of those uh, levels while right. it's consolidating. And then you get the breakout and you start trending higher and you'll get a period of, of overbought, like RSI will go above 70 and stay above 70 for a while. Right. And if you don't recognize it being in an uptrend, your first thought is when it hits 70, you want to sell it. But I think sometimes you can be overbought for a period of time, especially in an uptrending stock. So I do treat it. I treat the RSI and stochastics differently based on the type of market I'm in. Exactly. And this does show it fairly well. I mean, this is over here is even a longer um, sideways period. And like you say, the RSI is bouncing around basically around our 50 line. And then we do finally get our breakout and we get our RSI up there. So we've got like here, our MACD, you can see this, the uh, histogram makes it really uh, more obvious that the moving averages are essentially flat the entire way. They're going down, but they're, the, the delta between them is almost negligible for, for quite a long period until we finally get this breakout that they had in, in April. And then it's trending, but it's an uptrend. And of course, like you say, then we start to see different behavior in the, in the oscillators. But I think you're right. When we have the, the trend that's sideways, then I think the oscillators don't do well because there is, there's no, no momentum. There's not a lot of momentum going on. So as something that measures momentum, it's essentially telling us there's nothing there until we see a, a change, definitive change in one direction or another. Right. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, that was a really good lesson, I think, for a lot of folks out there maybe who are, um, you know, trying to figure out all the different oscillators because there's so many different indicators here at Stock Charts and they tell us different things and yet you can group them together. Um, you know, again, like you were saying, Bill, I think if you take four indicators that all kind of track the same type of information and you use those as your four indicators, they're always going to tell you the same thing. So I think it is good to use, first of all, to understand the indicator that you're using, make sure you understand how it's calculated and, and why it does what it does. But then finding some other things that corroborate I think it's important too, rather than just putting together everything that's going to tell you the exact same thing. Right. And I would say if, if obviously if people would like to dive into any of these in more detail, you can go up to a chart school. All the formulas are up there, all the logic, some of the history. Um, but this is a fairly high level overview, but if you really want to deep dive, I'd recommend going up there.